Okay, hello. Thanks for coming and listening. My name's James. Um, I part run a small um, adventure tour company called Untamed Borders. And as far as we, we guide stuff in Central Asia and the Middle East. And uh, I organize things in Iraq, um, sometimes for tourists, sometimes for skiers, and sometimes for professional people. So the talk's going to be a little bit about that and how I got involved in organizing um, ski trips to Iraq. Um, this is uh, one of our uh, ski tourists in Iraq, but everyone knows that's not what Iraq looks like. Iraq looks like this. It's hot, it's flat, and it's dangerous. And that's everyone's impression of Iraq. And up to a point, it is true. The majority of the country is flat. For most of the year, it's incredibly hot. But we do guide. I was out there in November uh, to the southern part of Iraq, and we you know, saw some sites. We went to places like this. This is the ziggurat of Ur. Um, it was built about 3,000 BC um, just in, for, by the Sumerian civilization. Uh, that's where the first writing came from. That's where the civilizations in the world first began in Mesopotamia. We also went to places like this, um, the Arch of Sesiphon. It's the world's largest freestanding brick arch built 1,300 years ago. But as you can see, it's still pretty flat. We also went to places like the uh, spiraled minaret in Samara, again very flat, and the flood at Al-Qaeda, again no mountains, and very flat. And people say, isn't Iraq uh, dangerous? And for some of my work, um, we go to places like, I went to Mosul in September, and this is the remains of the Al-Nuri Mosque in September. And so certainly some parts of Iraq are not particularly safe. When we were there, we, um, we could move around freely, but we were very sort of inconspicuous. I was working with a, a documentary team covering the effects of, uh, of the war with ISIS. And, but my favorite part of that uh, trip was meeting a man whose house was destroyed but he still had one wall left and his, uh, his grapes were growing there. And every day he'd go back there and water those grapes because he said at some point he'll get enough money to rebuild his house and at least there's something from the original house left. So even in places like Mosul, um, there's some interesting things going on. But in Iraq, the vast majority of Iraq, all of this area in the south is flat and it's very hot. But in the far north of the country, where the Zagros Mountains uh, that are mainly in Turkey and mainly in Iran, touch the corner of the Kurdish region, there are high mountains. The highest mountain in Iraq is at 3,600 meters. And in that area of Iraq uh, is where the Kurdish people live. Um, so Iraqi Kurdistan, um, it has its own government. It effectively is a sort of almost de facto, it's semi-autonomous, a de facto um, area. And it doesn't suffer from some of the other um, security issues uh, that faces Iraq. In addition to the mountains and the safety, um, visas are a lot easier to get in uh, northern Iraq. To go to Baghdad is a real pain to try and get a visa to go, whereas you can fly into Erbil, you can book a flight tonight, you'd be there tomorrow morning, you'd get a visa on arrival. So as far as bringing ski tourists to Iraq, that northern area of Iraq ticks a load of boxes. There are mountains, um, there are, there's good security, and it would be easy to take tourists to. And hopefully, well it does, it looks a bit like this. But you might ask, why did I want to do ski, touring in, uh, ski tourism in Iraq in the first place? And part of that reason is that uh, 10 years ago, in 2011, um, just as a bit of a publicity stunt, I organized trips in, uh, in Afghanistan. And we thought, won't it be fun to do a ski trip to Afghanistan just to try and get a bit of media attention? And the first trip we ran in the Hindu Kush was actually amazing. Um, in the central highlands of Afghanistan, as you can see, there's a lot of mountains, there's a lot of snow, and the ski trips um, were really good. We went back for a couple of years, and after some of the guests that we'd been with and some of the expats in Kabul donated skis, and people in Afghanistan started using those skis. Um, they didn't have all the correct equipment, so some of the bindings were a bit more um, rudimentary. Um, there was a Swiss guy as well who um, had spent some time in that region of Afghanistan, and he decided to set up a ski touring race. And I just want to be clear here, in Afghanistan there's no lifts, um, so all the skiing is ski touring. Um, the equipment means that you have two settings on your bindings. So when you're going up or on the flat, you have a loose heel, and when you're skiing down, you have a fixed heel. So you have the opportunity. Now, if you consider, the, you, if you just like going up lifts and skiing down, that sounds awful. It just sounds like you're basically walking up to ski down. But if you like hiking and you like snowshoeing and things like that, you get the best of both worlds. You can walk up, you get to see the beautiful views, and then rather than walk down, you get to ski down. So for people like the ski touring, 
in Afghanistan, there's, there's just loads of terrain. But this Swiss guy, he created a ski touring race in Bamiyan and in central Afghanistan. And this year, this winter will be the 10th version of that ski race. And every year, despite uh, the best efforts, every year it's always won by an Afghan. Because even though the Afghan guys might not be able to ski very well, you have to go up before you can get down. And the majority of the Afghan guys have got down before most of the international people have got up. And over the years, more equipment has gone through, more Afghan people have decent equipment. Um, and then the next generation of skiers come through. Almost every child in the last villages where we ski has a set of these. It's the, uh, it's the local ski system. And now there's a, there's a local ski race as well, a local ski touring race for kids. Um, and everyone has the, the, the same kind of design. But on top of that, on top of the skiing and the fun, um, more things started to happen. They needed, we needed Afghan ski guides. So people like Sajad on the right, this is Sajad. Um, if you know this, his badge says the uh, um, Afghanistan Space Program. But he, uh, this is in 2012, and he was starting to learn how to become a ski guide. There he is learning about um, um, the snowpack to assess avalanche risk, you know, when you're ski touring and off-piste, this is really important stuff. And after that, the Swiss decided it would be great. Afghanistan had never had anyone competing at the Winter Olympics. So someone like Sajad and his friend Ali Shah, they went for three uh, years to Switzerland to try and train for the 2018 Olympics in Seoul. And if that sounds a bit like the sort of Jamaican bobsleigh uh, story and they should make a film about it, well, they have made a film about it. It's called Where the Light Shines, and it's, it's an excellent idea and some great visuals on what it's like to ski in Afghanistan. So during that process, the skiers that were taken out to Afghanistan, most, the vast majority of them had a really great time and said, hey, James, where else do you do ski trips? And I was like, well, we don't. We just did this one in Afghanistan. That's all we ever like, you know, thought about doing. We hadn't really thought about it. But from working around in the Middle East, I always thought that um, Iraq, the mountains of Iraq, could be a good place to not quite replicate, but do a similar type of ski trip as we'd done in Afghanistan. And in 2014, we heard that someone in Kurdistan, in Iraqi Kurdistan, the north, was going to build a ski resort, was building a ski resort. At that time, oil prices were high. There wasn't any ISIS, and the Iraqi Kurdistan, actually, the economy was doing really well, and a lot of people were bringing money in and investing. And a wealthy uh, Kurdish guy decided to invest in what we had heard was going to be um, a ski resort. And there was a BBC report about it. I'm not going to show you the full report, because if you're giving a talk, you shouldn't really show videos. That always seems like a bit of a cop-out to me. But um, this is a clip from it. This is a reporter. And we can clearly see there's mountains, he's wearing a jacket, so it's cold. But there's one thing you might notice that's missing in that scene, and that's snow. And that's because where they built the Korak Resort, the bottom of the resort is at 800 meters in altitude, and the top's about 1,400 meters. So in the depths of winter, there is snow at the top, but they, and they built a small piece, and it's 200 meters long. And I think out of any country in the world that has a groomed piece, this is the shortest. It's even shorter than the snow dome in Dubai. So it is the shortest groomed piece um, in the world, I believe. Um, so it didn't really seem enough to build a ski trip around. A 200 meter piece didn't really seem enough to build it around. So we kind of shelved the idea for a year. And then someone drew me attention to this article in The Guardian about how uh, a Basque man has created a ski resort in the mountains uh, in a Kurdish village near the Iraq around Morda. Now I, know I don't really like the term fake news, but this, I, this, this didn't smell, smell quite right. I thought I would have heard somewhere else that there was another ski resort in Iraq. Um, and it turned out um, that these Basque guys had gone to Iraq and they were doing um, some ski training. Because unbeknownst to me, the Basque and the Kurds have quite close ties. There's this quite large Basque-Kurdish friendship society, which on the scheme of things sounds kind of weird. But on the other hand, they're both peoples that are spread across different nations. The Basque are spread across Spain and France. The Kurds live in northern uh, Iraq, Syria, Turkey, and Iran. So they actually have a lot in common, that they're peoples spread across different countries. So there's quite a large Basque-Kurdish uh, friendship society. And the Kurdish guys had gone to the Basque region, had gone skiing, and the Basque people said, we'd come back and we'd teach you how to ski. And I spoke to the, 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 the Basque guys. And, and from this picture, and from what I understood, um, it seemed to be quite a, a decent sized operation, but when I looked at the altitude of Penduin, it was about 1,200 meters, and unless it was some kind of specialized microclimate, I didn't believe there was gonna be enough snow there for, for a lengthy trip. But in 2016, I had a gig uh, working with another documentary team covering uh, the Yazidis and the troubles that they'd had with the fight against ISIS, and after that had finished, I thought I'd check out Penduin, I'd check out the Korok Resort, and I'd see if there really was enough skiing 
uh, another opportunity to go skiing in Iraq. And going to Penjwen, where the Basque guys are, also gave me another opportunity to go somewhere that I'd, I'd wanted to go for a while in, uh, in Iraq. And it was a hotel in a place called Sulaymaniyah. And it, it was kind of known in Iraq and kind of infamous for if somebody decided, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to volunteer to join up with the Kurds and fight against ISIS, or I'm going to volunteer and become a doctor in that conflict against ISIS, or I'm going to come and volunteer against something else. You went to that hotel, you waited around for a couple of weeks, told the guys at the reception, and someone from Syria would come up and pick you up and take you over. Now, that's not what I wanted to do, but I quite like people watching, and I thought it'd be kind of fun to stay at that hotel and just see who's in there, just to just take a look. And it was an interesting bunch. There was a couple of guys from the French Foreign Legion, a Mexican guy with a few thousand dollars worth of uh, telescopic sights and drones, a guy with one kidney from the Midwest with lots of seeds to help repopulate the land in Syria. And initially, they didn't trust me at all because when I introduced myself, I was saying I was setting up ski tourism in Iraq and it sounded like the worst cover story in the world and I was probably from an intelligence agency checking them all out. But in the end, they realized that's exactly what I was doing and, and we, we hung out for a bit. But anyway, eventually I went to Penjwen where the Basques had set up the skiing and it was great. It was a great little operation. I haven't got a photo. They've got a lovely little um, ski shop with all these cross-country skis in it. But that's what they were doing. They were doing these little runs up and down under cross-country skiing. I was like, this is amazing. It's such a great thing for like a day trip. It's like to go with the skis and hang out and stuff like that. But there's not a week's worth of skiing in, in, in Pentwin. So I nearly gave up, but I did have one last plan. I told you about the 3,600 meter mountain in, uh, in, in Iraqi Kurdistan. And I knew from expats and from other people that in the summer, people would often go there. A lot of people would go there. In the heat of Iraq, when it's 45, 50 degrees in the, on the plains, People would go to that higher area to go trekking, just to, to, to be at altitude to get some, uh, some, uh, some cool air. And there was a family called the Chamani family who acted as guides in that area, and they had some little lodges and things like that. So I thought, let me go and check them out and see if there's any sort of terrain up there. So to get there, you have to go along the, uh, the Hamilton Road. The Hamilton Road is quite a famous road in Iraq. It was built in the 1920s by a Kiwi in the British Army, and... It cuts through this gorge. They said it would be impossible to build. It was to link uh, Iraq to Iran. So it's quite a spectacular road um, passing through these gorges to get to Choman. And when I got there, the guy who I'd been speaking to, Omar from this family, he was very nice and extremely apologetic and said, I'm sorry, but my, my wife's three days overdue for her baby. Do you mind if my brother helps you out uh, and, and takes you up the mantle? I was like, no, of course. I mean, that's, that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, and so I strapped on the skis and uh, his bar, the Ray-Ban, we went um, into the mountains. And I was there to kind of scope out the, the terrain to see if there was any good runs, to see what the runs would be like, to see the snow, you know, as well as see the snow conditions. And I think this is the, the, the best and clearest photo I have of that day. And whilst I didn't manage to actually check out what the runs would be like, one thing was clear, there was enough snow. And, and it was fall. This was in late March, and it was falling quite late in the season. It was, there was still plenty of stuff there. So, to be honest, that day was enough to say, yeah, there's mountains, there's snow, there's enough in Iraq um, to bring some people over. So, in 2017, we brought our first group over. And to be honest, it was great. This is uh, the, the sort of photos from that side. It's got some amazing scenery. There's plenty of terrain. There's loads of stuff to do. I mean, it's ski touring, so most of the photos are people going uphill because you only do a, a couple of runs a day. Um, but we had a great time. Um, but with any um, ski touring, there's only certain amounts of terrain you can use. Some has avalanche risk, some you can't get access to. You can only ski sort of where you can. Um, but in northern Iraq, you're limited by other factors as well. Um, to the north side of Mount Halgood, where we saw some terrain that, that looked really good, we were told we couldn't go because it was a well-used smuggling route, smuggling alcohol into Iran and usually smuggling people out of Iran into, uh, across Iraq and into Turkey. Um, there was also been a lot of mines planted during the Iran-Iraq war. So uh, they, all, they know exactly where they are, but there were some places where there were minefields where we clearly couldn't ski. And you can see little bits of uh, unexploded audience from, ordinance from that uh, conflict in the, in the 1980s. But we had a great time. Uh, we enjoyed it, and during that time, uh, the Korak Ski Resort, if you remember that, the one with the, uh, the, with the no snow, there had been a lot of snow, and they decided they were going to hold a winter festival, and they invited us along. They'd heard there were some international skiers there, so we thought we'd turn along, uh, turn up. Uh, this is the, the sign at the bottom of the lift, and I like their, um, their policy of no weapons. 
Um, that's a shot of their 200 meters of, uh, of piece. It's actually from a different day, but that's the best shot we've got of the piece. And when we got there, the whole of the um, Kurdish media was there to meet us. And being international skiers, they were extremely excited that we've gone all the way to go to the 200 meters of piece. We'd traveled all the way in the world to go there. Uh, we were interviewed, this is Anna, our ski guide, uh, one of the many interviews she had to do that day. And it was a lot of fun. And during that time on the ride back to Choman, um, we discussed, um, you know, discussed skiing and discussing possibilities. And this lady, Ashley, who'd been to us, been with us skiing in Afghanistan, said, um, yeah, you can see it's, it's not that safe in Kurdistan either with the, the snowballs and things like that. But the, she said, um, why, don't, why, don't, you know, why don't we set up a ski race like in Afghanistan? You know, why, why not do more? Why just come for ski races? Why just come for a ski trip and not try and do something that's, that, that, that's larger? And we thought, yeah, why not? I mean, that sounds good. We can organize a ski touring race. We can see how it goes. And so that year, we, we, had, we, we searched around for some sponsors. We got some uh, companies to donate some more skis. Um, and quite a, but quite a lot happened between 2017 and 2018. Um, logistically, it was more difficult bet because between the first ski trip we did and the second one, uh, Kurdistan had had a referendum. They decided to break away from Iraq, and there were no international flights going to Erbil. So the trip was a bit longer. We had to fly into Turkey, cross the border, recross the border to pick up the skis that had been left behind, that didn't make it onto the flight with Turkish Airlines, come back across the border, and eventually make it to, uh, to Choman. And when we got there, our idea of a ski race had changed a little bit because the Choman Tourist Board, which we didn't know existed, but exists because people go there in the summer, had uh, remembered that in 1952 they'd started a, they'd had a winter festival for a number of years, for about 20 years, and then under Saddam Hussein he'd stopped this festival, and our little ski race that we were going to be was going to be the centerpiece of this revived festival, which was great that we had more logistical support. We had the Choman Tourism Board behind us, but it did make things tricky because a sort of Kurdish uh, winter festival is about dancing, music, drinking, a little bit of sliding around, huge snowball fights and music and dancing and everybody goes but they want some people want snow but they don't want to trudge through the snow so basically you want to hold it on the snow line so you can get to it have the snow and then go back Whereas if you're holding a ski race, you can't have a ski race on the snow line. So Ashley spent about three days with the Choman Tourism Board visiting different sites, coming up to a compromise. But eventually we found a good spot and we held the race and it was great. Um, these are the guys uh, from Penjuen. You can see the guy, they've got their cross country skis all in their matching Nike outfits. They came up from uh, the Basque area. It's not really Basque area, but you know, the, the, the Basque guys training. There were also, if you look at the ladies in the background in the caps, uh, there are three laid female Peshmerga. The Peshmerga are the Kurdish uh, military. Their physical training instructors from the Peshmerga, they said they wanted to take part in the race, so we helped them. We gave them a week's worth of uh, ski training, and they took part as well. Um, there was other people as well. There, a, a lot of Kurdish people have lived in Europe, so this guy, we don't really know his names. He calls himself Snake Eyes. He's come every year in his, uh, you know, skin-tight, all-revealing um, um, skiing outfit, and he, he competed. Um, and we had a bit of a problem because half the people are on cross-country skis, half the people are on ski touring skis, so we had to have two races. The cross-country race, the guys from Penguin won, and the uh, ski touring race, quite unfortunately, well, two uh, Aussie guys came first and, uh, and second in the race. And it was extremely popular, and everyone wanted us to come back again uh, last year to, um, to do it again. And in that time, um, things have developed a little bit more. There's now a small... Um, Ski shop, very small in Choman, so people can go and hire skis from the Chomani family. And also there's an organization called Free to Run that offers um, safe spaces for women to do sports in post-conflict countries, which includes Afghanistan and Iraq. And there are uh, ladies that from uh, the international internally displaced people from the conflict in Iraq and refugees from Syria that uh, now come and ski and have some time in the mountains to get away from the, the, the refugee camps. And last year, um, more media wanted to come and the Chamanis wanted to make it a bigger event, wanted more stuff. And we had to come up with ideas of, of additional things to do to keep it exciting. And the only the, the thing we came up with, I'm not sure why, was to build um, Iraq's largest snowman. And we're still confident that this is the largest snowman ever built in, in Iraq. It's not been disproved. And I guess it worked because 
Uh, just before the festival arrived, um, Rudai is the uh, Kurdistan's largest TV station, and that is a satellite dish on the back of their truck. So they did a live feed from the festival. So it's like a four-hour feed on their main channel about this uh, ski festival that we just decided to set up in the back of... Uh, of Kurdistan, at another news channel, uh, the guy in front of their green ski screen, they decided to fit out the news with all ski stuff because we had put this festival on. So that's the start. I mean, it's only, we're gonna be going out again this year, which will be the fourth year of, of, of doing it. Uh, it took about eight years in Afghanistan before people were competing for the Olympics. So if you see some news in about four or five years times that there's Iraqi people training for the Winter Olympics, uh, and it will be the first Iraqi people ever to do it, and they're going to make a film about it, then it's probably something to do with this. Um, thank you very much for listening, and if you have um, any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, no, no, no. It's now the without getting uh, uh, too detailed and political, um, when sort of ISIS took Mosul and, and, and sort of created this sort of caliphate in that area, the Iraqi army sort of ran away, basically. Well, ran away, I'm not going to offend anyone here. Uh, they, they left, and the Kurdish forces sort of came south to protect the Kurdish areas. And there's a city called Kirkuk, which is partly Kurdish, partly Turkmen, who are a small minority, and partly Arab. It's a bit like... Uh, sort of Brussels in Belgium. It's, it's, it's everybody's. No, you know, it doesn't belong to one. Everyone claims it, but it doesn't sort of belong to one. And the, uh, the Kurds held Kirkuk for a number of years. They had the referendum uh, to, to break away. There was a conflict between uh, the, Bag the Iraqi army and the Kurds. They left Kirkuk, and after that, the Iraqis were quite... It was all about Kirkuk, basically. And once Kirkuk came back under Baghdad control, they started the flights again. So, yeah, the flights are running. The flights are running is the short answer. I mean, it's the same, it's the Northern Hemisphere, so it's the same seasons as us. Um, to get the best, it probably um, late Jan to end of March is the best time, just to make sure there's enough kind of uh, snowpack. In ski touring? Um, despite all of this experience I've got, I'm, I'm giving you, if you might notice in that picture, I'm on the right, I'm wearing snowshoes, because I'm not a great skier. I just happened to get into skiing because I can ski, of course. But the best advice to get into ski touring, I mean, um, I mean, go to somewhere, yeah, go to somewhere in the Alps and uh, and get it. The actual touring, so, I mean, learn to ski off piste because the actual ski touring is not difficult. It's basically walking with a slightly different technique. The touring bit is not the issue. Uh, learning to ski off piste. Once you can ski off piste, you can ski tour. But the issue is always avalanche safety. You shouldn't go on your own. Um, you know, all of the stuff is kind of on the internet. But the, the first thing is to learn to ski off piste. Absolutely. Um, in yeah, in uh, Iraq, we have we most of the nights we stay in uh, Chaman in the town at the uh, one of the houses owned by the Chamani trekking uh, uh, family. Um, but there are a couple of, um, there's, a, there's a couple of places that people own. They're not always in the best position. This is the thing. It's always not, you know, it, things are not set up. So yeah, there is one place uh, that we have stayed out in. I mean, it's really cold once you stay up in the mountains. Sometimes we could, we've done it a couple of times, but usually the, 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 the difference is like a, whatever, 45 hour long journey, or you're like really freezing up in the mountains in the, in, in the refuge. So usually we come back down, but there are some possibilities to do it, yeah. I mean, as we said, we've been doing it for three years, so it's, it's still fairly exploratory. We've, we've got some really good little locations where we go skiing, and we know the people who own the, the houses up there, so it's a bit of um, discussing with them and saying, I mean, you know, you're basically turning up with someone with a private residence saying, oh, can you give us the keys? We're going to stay up there in the night in the middle of winter. And they're like, why are you doing that? That's kind of crazy. So you have to kind of like sort of um, develop, uh, yeah, develop um, friendships with people to be able to do these kind of things. Yes? Um, I guess, uh, I mean, just, I mean, it's, it's not about the skiing. 
that's the deal. I mean, people come because they ski, they want to ski in different places, but it's generally people who just want to, who love to travel, who want to go somewhere that is a, just a, a different experience. I mean, we organize trips, I organize trips in parts of Central Af in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in um, other parts of the Middle East, um, in, in Somalia, in some parts of Central Africa. And what sort of links those things together is going somewhere where, really, you know, your experience isn't, isn't through the prism of tourism. There aren't any other ski tourists. It's only kind of us. And what, like, it's, things happen. It is an adventure. You don't know what's exactly going to happen. We get, you know, you, we didn't know that like a satellite feed was going to come off the uh, thing. You don't know going there for the first year that it was going to turn into a festival that um, uh, hadn't been, you know, that Saddam Hussein had stopped. You don't know any of this. You know something crazy is going to happen because it always does. And the, the people that have been on, the, on, the, on our trips for the last three years, they've been part of that. They've been part of developing um, something within Iraq. And I think that's what appeals to people. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>